The Battle of Waterloo of 1815 was one of the most famous turning points in world history. So didn't you ever wonder what happened after Napoleon was carted away to St. Helena? My name's David Montgomery, and I'm the host of The Siecla, a history podcast that tackles exactly that. Join me as I cover France's overlooked century in between Napoleon and World War I, for rigged elections and shadowy conspiracies, for murder at the opera and terror in the streets, and so, so many revolutions. The Siecle is spelled S-I-E-C-L-E and can be found wherever you get podcasts. You can also visit thesiecle.com, where I post full annotated transcripts of every episode with sources, pictures, and maps. Now, back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 19, To the Brink. At the end of our last narrative episode, Philip the Bold was in a great position. He had outmaneuvered the Marmosets and re-established his hold over the French court. He took part in the negotiations at Lollingham and walked away with a truce set to last 30 years. And Philip's son John had just left home, leading a crusade. And while we know how the Nicopolis crusade turned out, at this point, hopes and expectations back in France were high. In this episode, we'll see Philip continue to wield power in Paris, but he won't do so unchallenged. The Duke of Orléans was growing into an able political operator and had a relationship with his brother the king that Philip could not hope to match. At this point, Louis is still unable to match his uncle's power, but every day he becomes more of a threat to Burgundian dominance. We ended episode 15 with the signing of the Truce of Lollingham and the wedding of the almost 30-year-old Richard II to the almost 7-year-old Isabella of France. This match was not uncontroversial at the time, but that was mostly because of the poor relationship between France and England. The marriage contract stipulated that it would not be consummated for a number of years, but at the end of the day, this remained one of the more creepy betrothals of the Middle Ages. There's an illustration from an illuminated manuscript of Foissas Chronicles that shows the wedding, which I think does a good job at conveying the discomfort of it, but maybe that's just me projecting modern sensibilities onto it. Fortunately, this wedding never would be consummated for reasons we'll explore later on in this episode. Still though, Isabella certainly liked Richard as a man who showed her great kindness, even if not in a romantic sense. But Isabella was not the only child of King Charles to get engaged in this period. In a more age-appropriate match, Philip arranged for the infant Dauphin Charles to be betrothed to his infant granddaughter Margaret back in 1394, and this arrangement was made official in 1396. Not that this marriage really does well by modern standards, as the bride and groom-to-be were second cousins twice over, but hey, aristocracy. So with Philip assuring a new familial connection to the heir to the throne, the Burgundian position in France seemed assured for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, the Duke of Orléans had been looking out of the kingdom to exercise his ambitions. While Philip had a firm grasp on the domestic affairs of France, he had less total control over the kingdom's diplomatic connections. Quoting Richard Vaughan, quote, If French policy in Italy before 1396 was characterized by a lack of realism and an excess of ambition, after this date it degenerated into an incoherence which was mainly due to the rivalry of Philip and Louis. So let's take a look at northern Italy. While Louis of Orléans was budding up with the Duke of Milan, the rest of the French court was beginning to become concerned with Gian Galeazzo's expansionist tendencies. As a side note, Gian Galeazzo was now the Duke of Milan rather than the city's lord, as he had bought the title from the King of Germany in 1395. One of Milan's targets for expansion was the Republic of Genoa. The Merchant Republic was a rich prize and one full of the factionalism that was so common in Italy. Gian Galeazzo made efforts to co-opt one of these factions in order to promote a more pro-Milanese view in the city. Gian Galeazzo made some efforts to directly annex the city, but was met with much resistance, so he switched strategies and conspired to place Genoa under the control of his son-in-law, Louis, Duke of Orléans. However, the opposing faction allied with Philip the Bold to offer up the role of defender of the commune to Charles VI. Philip was eager to prevent Genoa from falling into his rival's hands as the city was an important link in the Flemish commercial network, and Louis's acquisition thus threatened Philip's economic interests. 
The move to have Charles, rather than Louis, take control of Genoa was also supported by Queen Isabeau and served to underlie the opposing factions in the French court with regard to Italy. Where Louis supported his father-in-law, Isabeau opposed Gian Galeazzo, and Philip opposed Louis. The French acceptance of Genoese protection served to raise tensions with Milan, and after 1396, Louis of Orleans' Italian expedition was even more unrealistic than it had been in 1390. French Milanese relations were also not helped by Valentina Visconti's own deteriorating position in the French court. This was mostly the work of Isabeau, as she not only had a familial vendetta against John Galeazzo and his daughter, as the queen was the granddaughter of the uncle that the Duke of Milan deposed and probably murdered, but she also felt threatened by Valentina. When Charles was suffering from his episodes of madness, he reportedly reviled his wife, but was comforted by his sister-in-law. And of course, there were rumors that Valentina was the one behind Charles's illness. She was Italian, after all, and that was a land of witchcraft. All of this culminated in Valentina being banished from court in early 1396. It was rumored that Gian Galeazzo, enraged at both French interference in his Genoese ambitions and the treatment of his daughter, sent a warning to Sultan Bayezid, informing him of the crusade heading towards the burgeoning Ottoman Empire, led by the son of Philip the Bold. Granted, I personally find it unlikely that Bayezid required a warning from the Duke of Milan, as the preparations for the crusade and subsequent march towards Nicopolis were not exactly subtle. So with Genoa now offering a French beachhead into Italy, the Milanese alliance was no longer so necessary to maintain influence in the peninsula. Later in 1396, Isabeau arranged for a treaty between Florence and France with the intention of curtailing future Milanese attempts at expansion. But I don't want to give the impression that Isabeau was a fierce partisan at court. In fact, other than her hatred of Gian Galeazzo Visconti and some other family matters that we'll explore later on this episode, the queen mostly took on the role of mediator. While she was generally aligned with Philip the Bold on most issues, she also made sure to maintain a good relationship with Philip's enemies, such as the former Marmosets and the Duke of Helders. And speaking of the Duke of Helders, William of Ulick had inherited the Duchy of Ulick from his father in 1393, and after spending a few years crusading with the Teutonic Order, was back in the Low Countries. In 1397, a few Helderian ducal officials were in a pub in the Brabantine city of Sertogenbosch when a tussle turned into a bar fight turned into a riot. In the aftermath of the riot, one of those officers was arrested and executed by the Brabantine authorities. This was seized on by William as a pretext, and before long, he was back to his old habits of invading Brabant. After an initial attack on Brabant, Joan of Brabant was able to hold her own and launched a counterattack into Ulich. Meanwhile, the Duchess was meeting with her nephew-in-law, Philip the Bold, in order to gain his help against the Duke of Helders once more. This time, Philip had a more immediate motivation to help out, as he now controlled the Duchy of Limburg and the lands of Overmaas, which directly bordered Ulick. So, in order to coordinate their response to the Duke of Helders and Ulick, Philip and Joan met with the Estates of Brabant and the Prince Bishop of Liège, John of Bavaria. As a quick aside, the Prince Bishopric of Liège was wedged between Brabant proper and Philip's lands of Limburg and Overmaas. Furthermore, John of Bavaria was a younger son of Count Albert of Haino, Holland, and Zeeland. We'll be dealing more with John of Bavaria and Liège in the future, but for now, it's mostly important to note that Liège was geographically right in the middle of this conflict, and its ruler was generally aligned with the Burgundian camp. But back to the meeting. In this summit, Philip outlined his plan for the future of Flanders and Brabant, and unsurprisingly, this future was definitely Burgundian. Philip made the case that as he already ruled Flanders and would one day be the father-in-law of the Count of Haino, Holland, Zeeland, he was the best choice to defend Brabant and look after its interests. Furthermore, in this speech, he claimed that if he became the Duke of Brabant, that his dynasty would gain power like that of France and England, a prescient prediction. This speech to the Brabantine Estates is interesting as it really marks the first time that the idea of a Burgundian superstate in the Low Countries is explicitly given form by Philip. Still though, the form that Philip's idea takes definitely seems to be one of dynastic aggrandizement rather than anything else, and certainly shouldn't be seen as nationalistic in any way. And while this speech gains some significance in hindsight, at the time it did not get a great reception. The Brabantine estates valued their independence and refused to commit to having a Burgundian heir. Philip, for his part, had already convinced, or if you prefer, extorted, Joan to pass Brabant to him and Margaret, but that wouldn't count for much without the acceptance of the estates of Brabant. Philip did get more traction from the estates when he put his second son Anthony forward as a potential future duke, 
meaning that Brabant would remain in the Burgundian sphere of influence, but wouldn't essentially be annexed into the Burgundian dynastic union. However, he was still unable to get the estates to recognize Anthony, at least not yet. Although Philip didn't get what he wanted from Brabant, he knew that letting the Duke of Helder's Ulick rampage through Brabant would do him no good, and so decided to send a small army to help out, led by Valeron of Luxembourg, the Count of Saint-Paul. Valeron had a score to settle with the Duke of Helders, as his father had died in battle against the Duke's father. So the Count of Saint-Paul joined up with the Brabantine army led by Joan and the Liegeois army led by John of Bavaria by Maastricht. From there, the Allied force crossed the Meuse, or Maas, and went on the offensive, heading for the town of Vermont. Almost immediately, John of Bavaria demonstrated that he couldn't be trusted, negotiated a separate peace with William of Eulich, and led the Liegeois army back to Liege. To make matters worse, the Liegeois army ran into the supply train heading for the Allied army and decided that they could make better use of it than the Burgundian Brabantine force. So now the armies of Burgundy and Brabant had lost a third of their fighting force and their supplies, and so, as they were now unable to effectively besiege Roermont, the army decided to go raiding through Eulich. The campaign may not have accomplished much, although it did prove to be more productive than Philip's last campaign against the Duke of Helders, depending on if you consider raiding and pillaging to be productive. In the aftermath of this punitive campaign, William of Eulich convinced the King of Germany, Wenceslas of Luxembourg, to join him in a counter-counterattack on Brabant. However, this never came to pass, and William ended up making peace with Joan of Philip. Much to Philip's dismay, this treaty came at the cost of the Brabantine town and castlery of Krava, but eventually he ended up recognizing the terms of this treaty. Back in France, another summit was being arranged, this time between Charles, King of France, and Wenceslas, King of Germany. The goal of this summit was to find a way to end the Western Schism. During the negotiations around Lollingham, guarantees were made by both England and France that the two kingdoms would make attempts to end the Schism. But after the truce was signed in 1396, Richard II seemed to be uninterested in lobbying the Roman Pope to step down. In Richard's defense, guarantees were also made for further negotiations, but here the French seemed uninterested in holding up their end of the bargain, as hostilities had already been ended and any further negotiations would likely result in a worse deal for France. So with Philip desperately wanting to end the schism, he decided to look outside of England for an ally following Rome, and thus landed in Germany. The king of the Germans, not the Holy Roman Emperor, mind you, as he had not sought that crown, had been facing pressure from the princes of the Holy Roman Empire to end the schism ever since it first broke out, and so was receptive to the Duke of Burgundy's overtures. So in 1398, the kings decided to meet in the French cathedral city of Reims. During the summit, Charles fell into another bout of madness, forcing an early end, and Wenceslas spent most of his time in Reims so drunk that nothing productive got done even before Charles went mad. Unsurprisingly, this conference didn't solve the schism. It did, however, mark a low point in the prestige of the holders of the crowns of France and Germany. Philip ended up running the summit, and despite not getting any guarantees of help from either the King of England or the King of Germany, decided to move forward with his own attempts to end the schism. And so, about a month after the Roms conference broke down, the leaders of the French church agreed to withdraw from Avignon. However, France would not move to support Rome, Instead, they hoped that their withdrawal from Avignon would prompt other powers to do the same and force both rival popes to resign in favor of a compromise candidate. A French army then went down to besiege the papal palace in Avignon, a siege that would last for five years. This did not happen out of the blue. Philip had been doing his best to get Benedict XIII to resign for years now. The Duke of Burgundy traveled to Avignon shortly after Benedict's election to try and persuade the new pope to resign using a combination of threats and bribes. And while these proved ineffective, France's withdrawal from obedience to Avignon was one of those threats. While French policy was now thoroughly dedicated to ending the schism, they found themselves with few allies in this project. Castile joined France in their withdrawal from Avignon, Brabant and Liège agreed to withdraw from Rome, and Philip bullied the Roman-aligned bishoprics that covered his territory, Besançon, Tournai, and Cambrai, to do the same, but few others joined them. Although every power in Latin Christendom wanted an end to the schism, most were not willing to end their support for their chosen pope. Furthermore, France was not unified in its newfound opposition to Avignon, and the withdrawal was put into effect over the objections of many powerful figures, both lay and ecclesiastical.
The siege of Avignon proved to be an interesting one. Due to his imperious nature, Benedict had alienated both his cardinals and the people of Avignon, so when the French army arrived, they both deserted him. The Pope commanded the few men he had left in person, and enlisted many of his servants in the defense of the papal palace. He was even injured during an attempted storming of the castle. Louis of Orléans was a firm supporter of the Avignon papacy, even as soldiers had been ordered down in his brother's name. But what was done in his brother's name was not necessarily his brother's will, as Charles had become engrossed with his delusions once more in 1398. The king had been ping-ponging between sanity and madness since 1392. The king's delusions often included not recognizing those closest to him, such as his wife and children, but these were matched by more, for lack of a better word, interesting ones. For a solid year, Charles thought that he was a knight named George, rather than the king of France. And perhaps most famously, Charles sometimes thought that he was made out of glass and that he could shatter at any moment. During these periods of madness, the uncles, Louis, and the queen took every opportunity to enrich themselves. The truce of Lollingham meant that the magnates could plunder the treasury as usual without raising taxes further. So while these rounds of plundering were still bad for the French state's solvency and the French peasantry, they weren't quite as disastrous as the early ones were or the later ones would be. However, this reduced pressure on the treasury also meant that more could be safely plundered. By 1397, Philip was taking twice the amount from the treasury as he was in 1392, when he first regained his power of the purse. Later on, Louis and Philip would even skip the middleman of the French treasury altogether and grant themselves rights over taxation in large swaths of the kingdom. Now in 1399, the truce of Lollingham, on which this plundering depended, was at risk of being overturned. But before we get to that, we'll have to cross the channel to England. We last checked in with England in episode 15, with Richard reassuming power from the Lord's Appellant. So in 1397, Richard began a purge against several of the former Lord's Appellant. One by one, they were arrested and brought to trial. Some were executed and some were exiled. Thomas of Woodstock, an uncle of Richard, was exiled and then suspiciously murdered. So make of that what you will. But after this purge, Richard wasn't done. The next year, he decided to take action against Henry Bolingbroke, a former Lord Appellant and son of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. While Richard relied on the power and support of his uncle John, he feared what would happen when Henry came into the Lancastrian inheritance. Once that happened, Henry Bolingbroke would likely become the most powerful man in the kingdom other than the king himself, and although Richard was able to trust John of Gaunt completely, he had no such trust in Henry. In 1398, after some intrigues at court led to a judicial duel between Henry Bolingbroke and another former Lord Appellant, Richard took the opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. He ordered a halt to the duel and exiled both combatants. Henry's opponent, likely guilty of fresh treason, was exiled for life. And Henry, a likely loyal but still dangerously powerful lord, was exiled for a decade. So in late 1398, Henry Bolingbroke left England and settled where else but Paris. Well, in Paris, Henry set about making alliances with the princes of France. Meanwhile, back in England, Richard had entered the period of his reign known as the tyranny. In my opinion, tyranny might be a bit of an exaggeration when comparing Richard to the other kings of his era, but England's political framework was somewhat distinct from that of the continent. Richard relied on his royal prerogative and worked to expand the powers of the king at the expense of parliaments. Richard also worked to expand the English royal domain by using or abusing the power of royal eschiot. Richard cultivated an image of royal power much different from that of his grandfather Edward III. While Edward was a martial king who was often in close contact and deliberation with his military leaders, who were also generally the high nobles of the realm, Richard made sure to be more detached. He focused on arts and culture and largely ignored the military. We saw that he was much more keen on peace than Parliament, which was dominated by that same aristocratic military caste. But even outside of matters of war and peace, Richard did his best to cultivate a majestic image of kingship, which alienated many of those nobles. In early 1399, John of Gaunt died. The death of Gaunt was a momentous event in English politics in its own right, as the man was one of the biggest power brokers in England since the later years of Edward III's reign. But Gaunt's death was not the most important development of 1399. In the wake of Gaunt's death, Richard announced that Henry Bolingbroke's exile would now be for life, and that Gaunt's lands would be absorbed by the crown. This announcement jolted Bolingbroke into action. But before we can return Henry Bolingbroke to England, 
we need to assess the French court. As I said a few minutes ago, since 1392, Charles had alternated between a state of sanity and delusion. In early 1399, right around the time that John of Gaunt died, Charles had regained his sanity, and soon afterwards Paris was struck by a wave of the plague. The plague caused most of the great lords of the realm to return to their domains, such as Philip the Bold and John of Berry. However, Louis of Orléans remained with Charles, first in Paris, before retreating to Rouen. The two brothers spent a ton of time together during their isolation, without their uncles able to interfere. Louis always had a degree of influence over his brother whenever Charles was cogent, but the increased amount of quality time between the brothers, combined with the lack of presence of their uncles, allowed Louis to gain a significant amount of control over the royal government. Louis set about filling the administrative apparatus with his men and dismissing Philip's men whenever the opportunity came about, especially in the Parisian Chambre de Comte. But perhaps more significantly, Louis now had a great deal of power over the direction of French foreign policy. Just as Philip the Bold was eager to maintain peace because of his territorial interests, Louis desired a return to the fighting. The Duke of Orléans already controlled the county of Angoulême, which previously was a part of English Guienne, and he was eager to increase his holdings in the region. Furthermore, Richard II and Philip the Bold had a good working relationship, and while calling the two allies would be a huge exaggeration, Philip definitely did want Richard to remain in power in England. So of course, when Henry Bolingbroke was in Paris, Louis made sure to cultivate a partnership with the exiled English prince. Therefore, when Henry was looking for support in reclaiming his inheritance, Louis saw an opportunity to endanger the truce that Philip had worked so hard on, and used his increased influence to provide Henry with that support. That being said, we shouldn't overestimate the amount of aid that France provided. Really, Louis's biggest contribution to Henry's expedition were words of support and not standing in his way, which Philip almost certainly would have done if he had had the chance. So with Richard II on campaign in Ireland, Henry sailed for England with a small group of supporters. Once back in England, Bolingbroke saw his fortunes rise as many who were dissatisfied with Richard's rule flocked to his banner. As Henry Bolingbroke gained more supporters, his ambitions grew to match, and soon he decided that rather simply the Duchy of Lancaster, he desired the crown. Richard returned to England only to see his political position deteriorate further, and so surrendered to his cousin. The king was imprisoned and abdicated, and a few months after Bolingbroke first returned to England, he was crowned Henry IV. The deposed king died under suspicious circumstances a few months after that. While Louis was undoubtedly happy with the results of Henry's expedition, the uncles were dismayed. They viewed England as a kingdom desperate to return to war, and assigned much of Richard's own unpopularity onto the king's desire for peace. And while England would not repudiate the Truce of Lollingham right upon Henry IV's accession, the truce would not end up lasting the 30 years agreed to. Just as Henry IV was being crowned, Philip resolved to return to Paris in order to re-establish his control over the court. Upon his return, Philip was able to do that, but now Louis's position was too strong for him to be simply waved away. The two princes were now truly rivals. Philip also had more responsibilities in his territories and outside of France than Louis did, and even though for the rest of his life he would be in Paris as much as possible, the Duke of Burgundy did have to leave the capital from time to time, and on those occasions Louis was sure to profit from his uncle's absence. The rivalry between Louis and Philip would be aggravated by events in Germany, as Richard will not be the only king to be overthrown in this episode. As we explored both in this episode and in the last supplemental episode on the House of Luxembourg, Wenceslas, the king of Germany, was not a very good king of Germany. He focused all his attention on his other kingdom, Bohemia, for however much good that actually did Bohemia, hint, not much. He had been unable to do anything to bring the Western Schism to an end. He was a drunk, he was incompetent, and he was cruel. Now some of the charges brought against Wenceslas might stem from his political rivals and be exaggerations, but regardless of whether or not he actually had a cook roasted on a spit for messing up one of his meals, Wenceslas was considered to be a useless king by most of the German lords. So in 1400, the Rhenish electors of the Holy Roman Empire, being the Archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne, and the Count Palatine of the Rhine, met along with some of the other princes of the empire to demand that Wenceslas come and answer their grievances. Wenceslas, for his sake, was in the middle of dealing with yet another Bohemian revolt and could not make it. 
This excuse was not good enough for the gathered notables, and so the electors decided to depose the king of Germany, which they could do according to the Golden Bull of 1356, as they had four out of the seven votes. The next day, the Count Palatine Rupert of Wittelsbach was elected king. Wenceslas refused to acknowledge his deposition and Rupert's election, but he was also not about to start taking an interest in German affairs. However, the wider House of Luxembourg was willing to contest Rupert's election. Louis at once declared for Wenceslas, as the two had met during the 1398 conference at Rams and had fostered an alliance. The queen, meanwhile, declared for Rupert due to their dynastic connection. As Philip the Bold had a close relationship with the Bavarian House of Wittelsbach, he too recognized Rupert as King of Germany. But Philip could not be as overt in his support for Rupert as Isabeau, due to the Duke's ambitions in Luxembourg. Luxembourg was officially held by Wenceslas, but the king had mortgaged the duchy to his cousin Joscht while he was going through one of his many rounds of financial difficulty. Philip had spent the past few years cultivating an alliance with Joscht in order to increase his influence over the duchy. As Joscht was also the Margrave of Moravia, a component of the Bohemian crown, he had more important things to do outside of his dynasty's ancestral lands. Therefore, in 1401, Joscht agreed to hand the administration of Luxembourg over to Philip. However, Philip did not have long to revel in his newfound control of Luxembourg, as the next year, Joscht sold his mortgage to Louis of Orléans. And Luxembourg was not the only place that Louis was looking to expand his influence. Back in 1398, Louis began paying a fee rent to the Duke of Lorraine. The Duchy of Lorraine, also sometimes known as Upper Lorraine, was conveniently wedged between the Duchy of Luxembourg and the two Burgundies. So by having the Duke of Lorraine as a vassal, and by his later acquisition of Luxembourg, Louis began to directly interfere with Philip's territorial ambitions. Louis also moved to acquire more lands in Champagne. He already controlled Valois and Vertu, and in 1400 he purchased, with dubious legality, the lands of Cousy and Soissons, from the daughter of Enguerrand de Cousy, who died of plague after being captured in the Nicopolis Crusade. Now Louis also controlled a significant block of territory between Philip's Low Country domains and Paris. Louis's territorial bloc also allowed him to levy heavy taxes on commerce throughout his lands, which harmed the overland trading links between Flanders and Italy. Louis also gained the county of Perigord, which put him right on John of Berry's doorstep as well. Philip had to once again leave Paris in mid-1401. Now, Louis further worked to cultivate alliances and strengthen his own position while weakening his uncles. Louis acquired from his brother the cathedral city of Tournai. Tournai was home of a bishopric which covered most of Flanders, and while Philip had worked to increase his control over both the city and the church over the years, the city remained officially under the control of the crown, at least until 1401. 1401 was also the year that Louis established an alliance with the Duke of Helders and began paying a fief rent to the Duke of Bar, a territory right next to Lorraine. Louis furthermore increased his control over his brother while Philip was away. The Duke of Orléans gained control over the king's household and children. He also moved to gain control of several of the fortresses of Paris by placing allies in the captaincies of the Louvre, the Bastille, and the castle of Montlhery on the outskirts of Paris. So with Louis' schemes to marginalize Philip coming into effect, the Duke of Burgundy decided that it was time to raise the stakes. While he was out of Paris, Philip was taking care of important business. The Duke of Burgundy was making alliances of his own. He sent envoys to Rupert of Wittelsbach with the goal of launching a military campaign against John Galeazzo Visconti, and he met with the Dukes of Berry and Bourbon. In October 1401, the Duke of Burgundy wrote a letter addressed to the Paris Parlement, complaining of the improper governance of France in recent months. Really, Philip's true gripe was that he was no longer able to command the royal council single-handedly, but he couched the letter with language that made it sound like he was despairing at the state of the French administration and urging a return to good governance. His governance. Later in that month, Philip found himself in Arras to celebrate the betrothal of his second son Anthony and Joan, the daughter of the Count of Saint-Paul. In Arras, surrounded by his friends, vassals, and allies, Philip resolved to restore the proper order of things by force. And so, after the betrothal, the Duke of Burgundy gathered a small army and began to march on Paris. Thank you to my patrons. Christine, Comte de Chenonceau. Elliot, Graf von Kravenstein. Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf en James, Graf von Temsa. And Preston, Comte de Saint-Fargo. And thank you to my Knights of the Duchy, 
If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.